Hello everyone, I'm Tim Gray, and thank you very much for joining me today for yet another presentation as part of the Gray Learning webinar series. I want to start off by thanking Tamron for making this series possible by sponsoring the Gray Learning webinar series. And so we'll send you a follow-up email. There's actually a pretty cool project going on right now where you can tag your photos with a hashtag if you share them online, and then they might be featured in the Tamron Gallery. So look for an email follow-up to that. And I want to start off by mentioning that one of my email newsletters that had been neglected for a while is back after not really focusing very much on Photoshop elements. I've been getting an increasing number of questions from photographers who are looking at Photoshop elements in part certainly because Photoshop elements is still available as a standalone product that does not require a subscription. And so we've restarted the Photoshop Elements. Elements Weekly is the name of the email newsletter that focuses on Photoshop Elements. And so once again, in that follow-up email, I'll mention that if you're not already on the mailing list for Elements Weekly, we'd be happy to have you join us. So today, we're going to focus on the key new features in Photoshop Elements 2018. This is the latest version of Photoshop Elements. Note that the naming convention changed. So previously there had been version numbers, version 13, 14, and 15, for example, which did not correspond to a year. It was just a simple version number. Now Adobe has switched over to using the year. So while it's not yet 2018, 2018 is very quickly approaching. And so this new version of Photoshop Elements is referred to as Photoshop Elements 2018. And it has been typical that Adobe releases a new version each fall, around September, October. And so presumably that will continue, and so it will be named for the upcoming year. So I want to start off by taking a look at an interesting and perhaps clever and fun feature that is included in the Photoshop Elements editor. We'll focus primarily on the editor today, but we also do have some features that are available, a couple of new features in the Elements Organizer. I should hasten to add that, of course, many of the overall features have not changed. There have been some improvements in certain features. I won't go into those in any detail, but the overall interface remains the same. And so part of the reason that I wanted to present today's webinar is to help photographers get a sense of whether they might want to upgrade to Photoshop Elements 2018 to kind of get a sense of what features are new and might be interesting to them. And of course, for many photographers, since Photoshop Elements is a standalone product, you may not have upgraded in a while. And so keep in mind that I'm focusing today on the features that are new in Photoshop Elements 2018, but if you're still using Photoshop Elements 13, then there were also uh, upgrades in Photoshop Elements version 14, version 15, and now 2018. And so there may be other additional benefits to upgrading if you choose to do so. So I'm going to switch to the Elements editor here real quickly, and we'll take a look at a very interesting feature, one that can easily be abused, as you'll see in a moment. So I'm going to open up a photo here, and if we take a close look at my face here, it was a bright sunny day and my eyes are closed. And there's actually a new feature in the Photoshop Elements Editor that enables you to magically, as they describe, open eyes that are closed. Of course, this is not magic. Now you've, I'm sure, seen the feature that enables us to adjust facial features. We can op make a smile out of a more, you know, straight-faced, uh, open mouth, I suppose. You know, you can kind of curve up the corners of the lips to get a smile. You can stretch out the face a little bit to uh, lose a little weight virtually if you want to in Photoshop Elements. This new feature would seem a bit more magical by virtue of opening up those eyes, but what's really happening here is that we're replacing the eyes. So keep that in mind. And so the first thing you'll want to keep in mind is that this feature is destructive, meaning it will work directly on the pixels. It doesn't, unfortunately, create a layer mask for you with some blending, etc. And so the first thing that we'll want to do is to make a copy of our background image layer. And so I can drag that background layer up to the new layer, the Create New Layer button, the blank sheet of paper icon above the Layers panel over on the right-hand side. If you weren't already in layers, of course, you'd want to select layers down toward the bottom there. But once I've created a background copy, now I can go to the Enhance menu up on the menu bar and choose the option 
to, well, where'd my option go here? Uh, oh, there we are. So open closed eyes. I was looking on the wrong section. So enhance open closed eyes. And again, it's not quite as magical as it seems because we're not somehow magically fixing the eyes we're actually replacing the eyes from another photo. So you can see that the face regions in this photo have been identified, and so I can zoom in on the photo with a specific face region here selected, and then replace the eyes. Now, I've already added a photo as a potential source for better eyes, and so you're not going to see, in my case, the samples that are available before you've done that. So over on the right-hand side, you would normally see by default four faces that are available for you. Since I've loaded faces myself here, I'm not going to see those. We can remove faces, so if we decide that we don't want to have the faces we've already loaded, I could click the X on an image, and then you'll see that the Elements Editor here will actually load in some samples. So I warned you that this feature could certainly be abused very easily. You could uh, make somebody look not so great. So for example, if I click this first image here of replacement eyes, you'll see that the effect is not so good. The image of the man here at the bottom left may be a little bit better. You'll notice though that it's not exactly blending the color, etc. So there's some potential for problems here if you're not using a good source. Well, the thing to keep in mind is that this feature is really not aimed at taking a, an individual photo of a person and replacing the eyes with a completely unrelated photo, but rather to replace the eyes from one photo to another. And so, for example, if you were taking a portrait of a person, and in one of the shots, the shot you like the best, their eyes were closed, surely you also have another photo of that same person where their eyes are open, and so we could swap. So when it's the same photo shoot with the same person under the same lighting, it's going to be a lot more effective. So you can see certainly an opportunity to have some fun with a photo of a person if you wanted to, but instead I'm going to load some photos that hopefully will represent a better source for the eye replacement because there'll be photos of myself once again. I can choose from the organizer or I can just open from the computer. So I'll go ahead and click the computer button here and then I can bring up a set of images, select a set of images where my eyes had been open. Now again, ideally, I would have photos from the exact same source, and so, you know, under similar circumstances, etc. You'll notice that in some of these images, it's grabbing the wrong area, the wrong person, the wrong facial feature, so not always a perfect way to replace the eyes. It doesn't always do a perfect job. But we do have a photo here where it was able to locate the eyes, the face, rather effectively. So if I click and choose that as my source, then you can see that it replaced the eyes for the image. Not perfect in terms of the light blending. You can see that it's not quite getting the edge of the eyeglasses perfectly. So it, it's a bit of a challenge here. I'll turn off the before versus after view here so we can see before versus after. It's the right person's eyes, but the lighting was different, so there's a few other issues there. But still, an interesting feature. I do wish that, like you'll see with some of the guided edits, that you actually ended up with layers, but instead, if I click OK here to finalize the effect, you'll see that my background copy layer up here at the top right has been altered directly, and so I'm not actually able to go and refine the layer mask, for example, to clean things up. So I would call this sort of a very interesting capability, much like the ability to adjust facial features that was released in a previous version of Photoshop Elements. This is really interesting. I'd rather have a layer mask, but this could provide a good way to get started if that had been the case. In theory, we could certainly blend this background copy, add a layer mask, and then tidy things up by blending away the edges, for example. But I think this also speaks to some of the potentially better features down the road. We've seen the facial feature adjustment capability, now the eye replacement. And so obviously the image analysis in Photoshop Elements is getting better to the point that it's able to locate features and blend them reasonably well into, in this case, an existing face, for example. So hopefully that will just continue to improve. All right, let's get away from this example really quickly here. 
and we will take a look at another example. And so uh, we obviously, one of the perhaps most common scenarios for photographers is an interest in being able to replace a background. One of the most common requests I get when it comes to adjusting images is how do I replace a sky? I've got a sky that was not very good or that mis wasn't, was missing clouds, that just it wasn't my favorite sky. And I've got another photo that has a good sky. How do I go about replacing that? So the next handful of features that we're going to take a look at are actually guided edits. And these, I think, are very interesting. A lot of photographers dismiss the guided edits. Sometimes the effects are a little gimmicky, and there's certainly a couple new ones, uh, new guided edit features that are a little in the direction of being gimmicky, but still interesting. But one of the great things about the guided edits is that you're able to take the result and translate that into actual layers. You're able to see the layers that Photoshop Elements is using in the background to create the effect, so then you can refine the result. And I think that is one of the best aspects of the guided edit feature, is that ability to go through and refine the effect. So let's take a look at that guided edit. I've opened an image here. I want to replace the sky. Of course, the stereotypical cliche, if you will, replacing a clear sky with clouds. And so I'm in expert mode. I'm going to switch over to guided mode up at the top of the interface. And then you'll see that there are categories for all of the different guided edits. In this case, I want to go to the special edits. So I'll choose that tab. And then one of the brand new guided edits in Photoshop Elements 2018 is replace background. So I'll go ahead and choose replace background. And if you've not worked with guided edits previously, then you obviously won't be familiar with how things work, but today you'll see a variety of different guided edits that are new in Photoshop Elements 2018. And once you've seen a couple of them, you get the idea. It basically guides you, thus the term guided edits, guides you step by step through the various methods that you can use, the various steps that you would perform to create the final effect. And so there's varying degrees of adjustment available along the way. We can start off, you can see, for replacing the background, we need to create a selection. So I could use one of the selection tools, for example. I'll zoom in, zoom out a little more here so we can see the image a little better. And using the quick selection tool, I'll adjust my mouse size here. And I can just very easily paint through the object that I want to select. And that looks like it's done a pretty good job. For our purposes here today, we'll just assume that was a perfect job and move on. Normally, of course, I might zoom in and check my work and clean things up, etc. But then over on the right panel within my guided edit here, I can now go to the next step, step number two, which is to import a photo. So I'm replacing the background. Obviously, I need a background to use. I could use some of the various options that are available here. I could in, uh, insert a preset, essentially, a design, if you will. I could choose none, so I just end up with a transparent background, and I can update things a little bit later. I can fill in with a color, but for a photographer, of course, typically we would want to actually import another photo, so I'll click that Import a Photo button, and then I can go choose which image I would actually like to use for that replacement for replacing, in this case, the sky, or essentially anything that is not selected within the current image will be replaced. So I'll go choose the image, my replacement sky, that I'm going to use in this case. And you can see that, as if by magic, now those of you familiar with layer masking will recognize that you could have performed all these tasks by yourself, and that's actually true with the vast majority of the guided edits is that really the magic is in the guided part, not necessarily in the results. So there's a degree of providing you with some inspiration, and then, then there's also, of course, more importantly, that step-by-step -step guidance. So I can use the Move tool if I want to to move that background. I could resize, etc., and then I can even refine the edge. So if I zoom in, for example, let's go take a look at the edge. We might find an area that was missed in my selection, for example, so I could choose my subtract option and adjust my brush size, and I can just paint into this area so I won't worry about doing a perfect job at the moment. You get the idea here. I can subtract areas from the original selection so that I'm replacing the sky more properly, and I could, of course, add areas that had been missed. 
Note that we're of course using a brush tool for that purpose so we can adjust the size and opacity as well. And then an optional step, you'll notice that sometimes we have optional steps that you may or may not want. Obviously, if they're optional, that means you could just ignore them, but you might want to take a look at what sort of effect they'll provide. So if I click the auto match, auto match color and tone, this will attempt to blend the images together a little better. So for example, if you had a person photographed under you know, normal midday lighting conditions, but you're putting them against an image that was captured under golden light, golden hour, then obviously you'd want to shift the color for the person to match the background or vice versa. And so that auto match option makes that possible, just applies an automatic adjustment, in this case not a dramatic change. But then once we've gone through all those steps, we've reached the last step here for that replace background option, then I can simply click the next. Of course, I have a cancel button as well if I just say never mind, but I can click the next button. And now I have a variety of options in terms of how I want to go about essentially finishing my work. What do I want to do next? I could share to Facebook so that every everybody who's on the webinar presentation today could go like it on Facebook, for example. But what I would generally do in this case is then continue editing, and I want to continue editing in expert mode. So I'll go ahead and click that in expert button. Now I've been switched to expert mode, and over on the layers panel, we can see that I have my original background layer, which actually, as it turns out, is now hidden. I also have my new replacement sky in this case above that. And then on the top, notice that the guided edit created an additional copy of my background image layer and then created a layer mask so that only a portion of the image is visible. So this represents essentially all of the steps that you could have performed if you wanted to create this type of effect manually but again, the guided edit feature enables you to, in many cases, create the effect more quickly and guides you through those steps so that you don't have to try to remember which specific steps are involved. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and close that image without saving and open up another image so that we can take a look at yet another guided edit that I think is kind of interesting. And as is often the case with some of these guided edits, they're focused a little more on creating compositions, if you will, which could be interesting for a slideshow or for creating a photo album, for example, just adding an element of interest. And one of the new options is the ability to add an overlay, to add a shape overlay. And so I'll go back into Guided Edits, and we'll take a look at the Fun Edits. And I will scroll down and find my Shape Overlay effect and click on it. Notice, by the way, that the Guided Edit gives you a preview. So up at the top right, I can mouse over to see the before version of the image or move my mouse off the image to see the after effect. So get a sense of what effect we're aiming to accomplish here. And once again, we get step-by-step -step guidance. So I can click the Select a Shape button and then go choose which shape I would like to use for this effect. I'll go ahead with and use this Heart option here for example. So I've selected my shape and then if we scroll down, you'll see that the next step is to use the Move tool. So I could click on the Move tool button to activate it and then click and drag. So in this case, you'll notice that I have a heart that's a little small for the image and I have a bounding box with some handles here. So not only can I move the actual shape, the heart in this case, but I can actually resize it as well. So I'll drag the corners, for example, to increase the size of the heart, maybe drag it into position here, center it over the Duomo. Maybe I want to make it a little bit taller so I could stretch it out by using the handle at the bottom center, for example. And then when I'm happy, of course, you'll notice that we have a commit versus cancel button down at the bottom right of my bounding box here. I'll go ahead and click the green check mark button there in order to apply the change, to commit that change. And then I can choose a couple of effects. So the outside effect relates to the area outside of my shape. You'll notice that the basic effect here is that the background has been dimmed down, essentially reduced in opacity, if you will, and that the area inside the shape has been left alone. It looks like the actual original photo. So I'll go ahead and click Outside Effect here, and you'll see that there are a variety of options to choose from, including some textures. Maybe I'll go with a sepia tone type of effect here. 
in order to make that image look a little more old, if you will, a little more of a timeless kind of sense to the image. But notice that in addition, I have an intensity control. So I would say that this sepia type effect is a little bit strong. And so I'll drag that slider downward a little bit for intensity so that we can bring back, in this case, a little of the original color, just a little hint. And that gives me what I think is a little bit nicer effect. I can also choose an inside effect. So I can click that inside effect button and then choose the type of effect I might want to use. So a different effect perhaps for the area inside the shape. Personally, I would tend to leave it alone because to me part of the idea here is to focus the viewer's attention on a particular area of the photo, a person in the photo, for example. So if you would chosen one of these options, you can also click the undo button up at the top left, no effect for the image, for the inside portion of the image. And then we have an optional step to crop the image. We can also crop automatically to the shape so that we would tighten up just around the heart itself here. And if you don't want to crop at all, of course, you can just skip that step. And once again, choose next, followed by, I would use typically the in expert setting there. And you'll see again on the layers panel, some rather sophisticated adjustments here in terms of adding a shape and a clipping group and a variety of different effects that are making all of that possible. So an interesting ability to add a shape to highlight a particular subject. And again, this is something that I would consider more useful for creating a slideshow or printing for a photo album or something along those lines. All right, I'll once again close that image and we'll take a look at another image for yet another guided edit. So a recurring theme here, Adobe has been focused a lot on the guided edit features of Photoshop Elements. So various creative effects that enable you to be taken step by step to create a number of different effects. So once again, switching back into the guided mode. And in this case, I want to go back to the special edits and we're going to take a look at the watercolor effect. And this creates something of a painterly type of effect. I'm not sure that I would call it precisely a watercolor effect that you might be more familiar with already, but it is in that sort of genre. And it's certainly interesting in any event in terms of being able to create a sort of a unique, taking a photo and going beyond a photographic effect. So in this case, kind of a watercolor painting type of effect. And so over on the right side, you see our first step is to choose an effect. So there's one, two, and three here. The two and three options really give you a lot of black ink in the image. And so I tend personally not to prefer those. I tend to like effect number one the most for this effect. So I can go ahead and click on the button for that effect. And you'll see we already know from seeing the other guided edits that what's really happening is in the background, the elements editor is creating a variety of different layers and adding effects, etc. So when I click that button, you'll notice that a couple of filters are being applied. So we get a sense of what Photoshop Elements is doing in the background. I can then go to step two to choose a watercolor paper overlay. And again, you'll see a variety of different effects there. Maybe I'll go ahead and choose the second, uh, the second row here, the first thumbnail on that second row. There are a variety of other options as well though. And then I can adjust the opacity, the strength of that texture effects. So if I want to tone things down just a little bit, for example, uh, or not as the case may be. So we have that opacity control. And then we can choose a canvas texture. So this is a watercolor painting effect after all. And so you may very well want to apply a canvas texture effect, a watercolor painted to canvas. So perhaps I'll choose that first texture effect, for example, and I can also adjust the intensity. So this is much like the opacity control that we saw previously. We can adjust the overall strength of that texture effect that we're adding to the image. So I'll adjust that down just a little bit. You can see the texture in the background there. Usually a little easier to see on smoother textures within the photo or, of course, by zooming in. I can refine the effect a little bit. Now, this might make it sound like we're able to bring back the original photo. It actually relates just to the paper effect. But if I click that refine effect button, you can see that I can add and subtract much like we had seen previously with our other guided edit. I can add or subtract in replacing the sky, for example, or here 
to hide or reveal the paper effect. So maybe I want to kind of clear out some of that paper effect from the bottom right of the image. I can paint into that area and blend it away, for example. And then an optional step, we can add some text using the type tool. And so naturally this means we can put some words, maybe describing the overall subject here. So maybe I'll just type poppy. So I can just click in the image. I can certainly adjust all of the various font settings. So I could select the text and maybe choose a different color, for example, etc. For now, I'll just leave that set to white and click the commit button in order to change, to apply any of those changes and move the text around. And I can also adjust the text style. So I could, for example, add, a, in this case, a stroke and a drop shadow effect to the text. It also is reducing the opacity, the fill for that white text color that I had selected. So I could refine those settings as well. So just additional options that you may want to take advantage of, but the overall effect, of course, being that actual watercolor sort of painting type of effect for the photo. And as we've already seen a couple of times, we could then choose to continue and to go to the layers in expert mode. And now keep in mind, once again, I really can't emphasize enough how much flexibility this gives us to be able to use guided edit but then refine things later with expert mode. Now, this also enables you to learn how the guided edit is working so that you can get more familiar with some of these various features in Photoshop, in Photoshop Elements, but it also means that you can change things. So I could go change the text. So this is actually an Oriental Poppy, so I could change the text to Oriental Poppy if I wanted to. Uh, I could also change the actual watercolor effect. I would need to resize my text box here. Uh, I can adjust the overall watercolor effect. So if I turn off that watercolor effect, the paper itself, or bring it back, you'll see that I have a layer mask as well. So I could modify that layer mask. So I have a variety of options available to me in terms of going back and changing what effect is actually visible versus not visible or where the effect is visible versus not visible, etc. So we're really being taken step by step. It's as though we were working in expert mode, but Photoshop Elements was doing the real heavy lifting for us in terms of creating the base effect, and then we can fine tune things. All right, we'll go ahead and close that image once again without saving, and we'll open a couple. Well, actually, I only need to open the one image in this case. So if I have a photo where I want to create a double exposure type of effect, this particular double exposure, it's not an in-camera double exposure per se, but rather a feature for isolating a key subject. So for example, with a person, we could isolate that person and then add a, a backdrop essentially, add a double exposure type of a backdrop. So it's very similar to an in-camera double exposure, but with the extra benefit of a layer mask essentially, so that we're revealing one of our layers only in certain portions of the image. So once again, I'll go to the guided option. So I've opened up an image and I go into the guided option, the guided edit mode, and this particular, the double exposure effect is found under fun edits. And so I could go choose double exposure. You'll see the before and after here. So we're isolating a subject and adding a, another image as a double exposure type of effect. So I'll go ahead and choose that option. And step number one, again, we're isolating a subject so that we can create this double exposure effect. And so the first step over on the right panel here is to use the crop tool so that the subject appears in the center of the frame. I know this is something that we would normally not do. We normally don't want our subject right in the center, but this particular effect works a little bit better if the subject is at the center of the frame approximately. So I could certainly fine tune that crop overall if I wanted to tighten things up, for example. I can adjust that crop box just by dragging any of the corners or edges. And then when I'm finished, click the commit button in order to actually apply the effect. And then I can use a selection tool. So I'll just use the quick selection tool in this case, and I can adjust my brush size, of course, and then just click and drag across my subject in order to select it. So the subject that I want to essentially emphasize with this guided edit effect, 
with this double exposure effect. I missed a portion of the face there. Notice though that as I'm clicking and dragging across the face and et cetera here to add to my selection, I ended up getting too much of the image. In fact, all of the image. So I can hold the Alt key on Windows or the Option key on Macintosh to access the Subtract from Selection option. And then I can click and drag in areas of the photo that I want to subtract. So I can release the Alter Option key if I need to add. So paint in a couple of additional areas here to add to that selection and as needed subtract. I think that gives me a pretty good selection there though. Keeping in mind that when I'm finished with my guided edit, I'll be able to refine that layer mask in expert mode if need be. So we can move on then to the next step, which we can see is step number three to choose a photo to superimpose over my existing image here. And I can use one of the provided examples, but I can also click Oops, I've got a problem there with my selection. I must have clicked somewhere else. So I'll hold the Alt or Option key once again and subtract from that additional area in the background. And try and get that cleaned up just a little bit. I'm going to show you shortly another feature that actually does an even better job of creating selections like this. I uh, just wanted to not co-mingle those different effects here without having talked about the feature in advance. And so we'll clean that up. Looks like we've got uh, uh, the equivalent of our hourglass here. Photoshop Elements is taking its sweet time to upgrade here to update the selection. And I suppose that means that being a brand new release of Photoshop Elements, still a few minor issues to work out. And very often I find that Photoshop Elements, when it's brand new, there will be some issues where some of the resources get tied up. So if you run into a situation like this where it becomes non-responsive, then I would just quit out of Photoshop Elements, in this case the Elements Editor. And so I'm going to go ahead and do that here. So I'll quit that. The adventures of live presentations, of course, but also the adventures of using a brand new release. Obviously, as I'm sure many of you are familiar, very often once a brand new operating system or new version of a software application is released, within a couple weeks or a month or so, then we start to see additional updates available. And so uh, obviously an indication here that we probably could use a, a new update to the Elements Editor here. So we'll just relaunch the Elements Editor. I'll launch the organizer that I had quit in the background there. And we'll reopen that image. Fortunately, if I forgot what steps are involved, that's no problem at all because the guided edit is going to give me that benefit once again. So I'll just quickly kind of recreate those steps that I had applied previously. So I'll crop downward a little bit, for example, and drag the crop box so that the person is more centered, apply that crop, and then try to create my selection, hopefully with greater success this time. You can see once again, dragging a little bit and getting the person and the background over on the left side. So again, holding the Alt or Option key on the keyboard, to subtract, releasing the key when I want to add, and something like that looks to be a pretty good starting point. So we'll scroll down again, and now we can see the sample images that are provided automatically for you, or you can import a photo, and so I'll bring in a New York City skyline photo, for example, since I live in New York City, and then once I've inserted that photo, so you can see the double exposure effect here, I have the city skyline down below, the clouds and the late afternoon light up above, and then I could adjust the intensity as well. So if I wanted to bring back more of the person versus more of that double exposure effect, I can adjust that intensity setting. And then I can also move that background. So I'll click the Move Tool button here, and then I can click and drag and that will actually move my background. Notice that the background double exposure effect is only visible where the person had been selected, where I created that selection. And so as I drag the image over, I can actually have some flexibility here because the outer bounds of that background photo is 
going to be way out to the side. So I have quite a bit of flexibility for where I actually position that background. I just want to make sure that my bounding box then falls outside of the subject that I had originally selected. So that looks to be perfectly fine. I can also choose to add effects to the double exposure. So you see a variety of rather interesting, some colorful effects. Maybe I want to go to a black and white interpretation or add an interesting sort of purple and orange color overlay, or I can just choose no effect at all. And then once again, click the next button when I'm ready to finalize that effect. And then in this case, I would again typically choose that in expert mode. And you can see that this is an even more complicated effect. We've got a variety of different layers, adjustment layers, image layers, with blend modes having been applied. So a number of different effects that have been used to create the final result for that particular guided edit, for that double exposure guided edit. All right, I'll go ahead and close that image once again without saving. And then I've got a couple of other images. I'll actually go ahead and open both of those images at the same time. And this is, you might have noticed, a new feature when I was using a couple of those guided edits, there was an option to create an auto selection. So I was using the quick selection tool. And so we still have, of course, access to the quick selection tool, a variety of different tools that are available, but we also have this new auto select option. And so I can effectively create an automatic selection. So you're probably familiar with some of the other selection tools. If I use the lasso tool, for example, then I need to trace around my subject. Not very much fun, I can tell you, to have to do that much work just to create a selection. But I also then can use this new feature, auto selection. So the auto selection, it still gives us access to the quick selection, to the magic wand, etc., the, the brush that we can use to modify the selection. But now there's this new auto selection option, which I think is just absolutely incredible. Sometimes. So when it works, it's amazing. So you can imagine creating a selection of the person, the silhouetted person here, maybe not too terribly difficult, but we would have to click and drag with the quick selection tool or trace with the lasso tool. With the auto selection feature, we can now just click and drag to draw a marquee, to draw in a rectangular marquee around the subject, the object that we want to select. So you see that I just have a basic rectangle, which would not be a very good selection for the person here that I'm trying to create the selection for. When I release the mouse, however, Photoshop Elements will look within the area that I selected and essentially try to figure out what the object was, what subject existed there that I might want to actually have selected. And you can see it actually did a pretty good job of creating that selection. So let's take a look at a more complicated example. So now I have an image of a red barn at sunrise with a nice cloudy sky, but maybe I want to apply some adjustments to the barn well, using that auto select feature, and generally I just want to make a selection, a marquee that's as big as the subject that I actually want to select, essentially trying to isolate as best I can. So when I'm using the marquee tool in this way, this marquee selection, I can move the selection by holding the spacebar key on the keyboard. So I can hold the spacebar to move that selection box then release the spacebar so that I can adjust the size for that selection. And when I release the mouse, once again, Photoshop Elements will analyze the scene and try to figure out what it was that I was trying to select, and it will try to create an automatic selection. Now, of course, at the moment, it might look to you that this actually worked perfectly well, that we have an absolutely perfect selection of the barn, one of the ways to be even more impressed by the effect is to zoom out on the image so that you can't actually see the detail very well. But let's go ahead and zoom in. And if we look closely at that barn, you'll see it didn't actually do a great job. So as is often the case with creating somewhat automated selections, you'll generally get better results if you are creating a selection of an object that is relatively easy to select. You may have noticed over time that the selection tools have gotten better and better. So we had 
the magic wand tool, for example. Now we have the quick selection tool. And the quick selection tool actually does a very impressive job. You might have noticed with the previous effect when I got too much of the image included in my selection of the person and then use the alt or option key to access the subtract from selection feature, dragging on that background, it was suddenly able to almost magically select the edge of the person. So it sort of gets more intelligent with time. I also expect that this auto select feature will improve over time. Obviously it can be challenging to figure out what object did I mean when I just drew a rectangle over the image? But then there's the element of separating an object from the background. So in this case, I would say that Photoshop Elements seemed to have done an excellent job of identifying what I wanted to select. It just didn't do an excellent job of actually selecting it. That said, this is a very quick starting point. I could then refine the selection. So I would say it's worth taking a look at this feature seeing if the auto selection tool will provide the effect that you need, will create the selection that you need. In many cases, I found that it does a very good job except for a few small areas, and then I can use the quick selection tool in order to clean those areas up, and that that gives me a faster way to get to my final selection. So in some cases, it will work very well. You can see again for the image of the person here, if I switch to that image, that is a very good selection. We can zoom in and see that it actually did a rather good job. This is arguably an easier selection to create, of course, because we've got a pretty strong silhouette. But point being is that it does give us, the auto selection tool does give us the potential for a very fast selection of a subject. But keep in mind, it's not always going to be a perfect selection. All right, we'll shift gears here and switch to the organizer. Uh, just a couple of features that I want to show you here, and in many respects you might say related features. And so we can browse images, of course, within the Elements Organizer. If I take a look at a particular folder, for example, you can see that I have a wide variety of photos here captured in the Palouse region of eastern Washington state. And so if I wanted to share with you some of my favorite photos from the area, Presumably I would use a filter, but that means I need to assign a star rating to all of my images and then filter based on star rating because probably you don't want to see a huge number of photos when I show you, you know, a folder full of photos from my most recent trip to the Palouse area. You don't want to see everything, you just want to see the best. Well, again, that could be a star rating filter, but the Elements Organizer, now with the 2018 version update, includes an automatic curation feature. So it can curate your photos for you automatically. This obviously involves a degree of image analysis. And you might notice that's a little bit of a recurring theme. So we have the feature that has been there for a little while to adjust facial features. I mentioned being able to take a frown and turn it into a smile, for example. You saw earlier today how we can replace the eyes in a photo, and that involves automatically detecting where the eyes are. And so a variety of different capabilities. We can search based on the contents of a photo. We can create a selection somewhat automatically just by drawing a box around the area where our subject exists. And so Photoshop Elements is getting more and more sophisticated in terms of analyzing our photos. And this auto curation feature is just another example of how that image analysis can help us as photographers. So when I'm browsing my images here, I'm browsing in this case just one folder full of images, up toward the top right of the Elements Organizer, you'll notice there is an Auto Curate checkbox now. I can turn on that Auto Curate checkbox, and actually I'm going to zoom out so that we can see more images at once, just to make it a little easier to see how this feature works. Notice that I have 294 photos in this folder that I'm currently browsing. And right now I'm viewing 50 of them. In other words, the Elements Organizer has curated that group of photos from 294 down to just 50. I can though adjust essentially how many photos do I want? How strictly do I want Photoshop Elements to curate those images. So I could drag over toward the right, for example, if I want to see more images. So now I have 198 out of 294, so I'm reducing by roughly a third. 
And as a result, you'll notice that now I have a variety of duplicates of very similar shots. So there's a sequence of four images here, for example, that look very similar to each other because, of course, I'm capturing multiple images of the same subject, maybe shifting my angle just a little bit. And so if I don't curate down to a relatively small number of images, there's, of course, that risk that I would end up with some redundancy, with some duplication. And so I can reduce the number. So drag that slider over toward the left to reduce the total number of images that I'm including. And so now, for example, I've gotten down to just 32 images. And if we take a look at those photos, you'll see now there's not much duplication at all. I don't have that many images that contain the same subject under the same conditions. So for example, I obviously photographed some hang gliders and paragliders during this visit. And so I have four images, but they're quite different. The color overall is different. There's one hang glider and three paragliders, but very different conditions overall. Now this curation is not just looking at images that are different, it's actually trying to curate based on quality. And so it's looking at things like contrast and color saturation and the degree of focus, how sharp the image is. Just as we can kind of auto-evaluate the quality of a photo, this curation step takes it a bit further where we can not only find our best photos conceptually, again, this is based on image analysis, so it's not going to make the same decisions that you necessarily would, but we're able to have that sort of automatic curation very quickly and adjust based on how many photos we actually want to see in relative terms. So now I've gotten down to just 32 images based on that auto curation capability. And this is related to another new feature, a change in feature, but in many respects a new feature in terms of the final result. So I can actually take this curation and use it to create a slideshow automatically. And so down at the bottom, you'll notice that we have a slideshow button at the bottom of the Elements Organizer interface, and I can click that slideshow button. And in this case, I've already enabled that auto curation feature. If I turn that off for the moment and then click slideshow, then it will ask me if I want to curate based on that automatic analysis of my images. And so I can choose, you'll see here that I have the option to have the Elements Organizer pick the best, in other words, to curate the slideshow for me, or to just use all of the media. I'll go ahead and use that pick the best option and we'll create a slideshow here. Again, I could have simply used that auto curation feature and then enable that, adjust the slider, and then at that point use all photos because that will be all photos that are currently visible based on any filtering that I've applied, etc. And so then, regardless of which approach I've taken to enable auto-curate first or leave it turned off and then essentially enable it as part of creating that slideshow, then a slideshow will be created for me automatically. And this is literally, it's referred to as a one-click dynamic slideshow because it literally involves a single click and the Photoshop Elements Organizer will then create the final slideshow effect for me. And that can include title slides that include different images that are not even your own images. In other words, images that are used as part of a theme. You'll notice over on the left side, we can choose to view which media is included as part of our slideshow. We can choose which themes are used or available so we can switch between the different themes. And we can choose the music settings. The preview here is almost finished. I made the organizer do a lot more work by not filtering the images with that auto curate feature first, but now it is taking all of the images that it decided were my best photos and creating a slideshow based on a theme. So again, keeping in mind, I just clicked once to choose that option. Well, okay, twice because I chose the option to use the favorite photos, but I click and, light, uh, and Photoshop Elements, rather, the organizer here is creating that slideshow for me automatically. And it starts playing, and so you can see a title slide created for me automatically and blending through different effects, transitions, etc. Now, all of those, of course, are based on the themes that are available. So I can choose among the different themes here. I have the watercolor theme selected, for example, 
and within that, of course, we have the different effects that are being added. So this kind of painterly edge effect. But again, all of that created for me very, very quickly and easily. And then I have a couple of options for how I'm going to share the final slideshow. So I can actually save the slideshow as an editable project. So I can click the Save button here and then just type in a name for the project and then I'll be able to go back and edit things later, change which images are included, etc. And perhaps most importantly is I can export the slideshow. So conceptually, this is a good result or I could create a video and then put a voice annotation over it, have a voiceover for the effect for that final slideshow. But then I can export the slideshow so that I'm able to very easily share it with others. So I can share directly to Facebook, I can share to YouTube or Vimeo, but what I would typically do is to export that video locally. So I can choose the resolution, essentially the quality setting for that video, 720p versus 1080p resolution. So that'd be 1280 by 720 pixel resolution versus 1920 by 1080 pixel resolution, both HD formats, high definition video formats. I can choose where to save it and what to call it, and then the Elements Organizer will render that slideshow as a video so that I could upload it to virtually any sharing service, so social media or using any of the other various ways that we can share videos, YouTube and Vimeo, for example. And so I can export this and then upload it. Of course, I did have that option to export directly to, for example, my YouTube channel, but now I can actually take that result, that slideshow video, and bring it into a video editor. So for example, the uh, Premiere Elements, Adobe Premiere Elements editor, so that I can actually edit that video, add a voiceover effect, or change the music, or whatever I would like to do. So again, some rather interesting capabilities that are made possible by that image analysis feature. I'm just going to go back and I will not ch save the changes for that slideshow at the moment so that I can bring us back to the Elements Organizer and thank you all very, very much for joining me today for this presentation on the new features of Photoshop Elements. Once again, part of the Gray Learning webinar series sponsored by Tamron. So thanks again to Tamron for making the presentation possible. Thank you, all of you, for joining me today. If you have any follow-up questions, please feel free to send those to me via email. A little bit later today, you will receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording for this presentation if you'd like to watch it again or if you missed part of it. By all means, feel free to share that recording with anyone else you think might be interested in learning more about the new features in Photoshop Elements 2018. And if you're not already on the Elements Weekly email newsletter list, I encourage you to sign up for that so you'll get weekly updates with tips and techniques and recommendations and commentary related to Photoshop Elements. If you are already on the Elements Weekly email newsletter, you might be familiar that we have launched a new bundle that we have in production right now on Photoshop Elements. And before we finish publishing those courses, there is a pre-sale price, so you can get it at half price, essentially, if you're interested in learning more about that bundle so that you can learn to really make the most of Photoshop Elements, both the organizer and the, ele uh, the Elements editor, then you can visit timgray.me slash PSE bundle, that's Photoshop Elements bundle essentially, so PSE bundle, that will take you to the Gray Learning website with all the information about that new bundle of video courses to help you truly master the use of Photoshop Elements based on 2018, but it still will apply to earlier versions as well with very little modification. Just obviously some new features are available in the new version that you might not have in whichever version you are currently using. But again, thank you very much for joining me today. I hope this has been helpful to give you a sense of how you can put to use some of the new version, uh, the new features rather, in the latest version of Photoshop Elements, version 2018. And hopefully that helps some of you decide whether or not you want to upgrade to this latest version as well. So thanks again, and we'll look forward to having you join me for a future presentation as part of the Gray Learning webinar series. Thanks very much.